guys doing? Hey, man. Um, on this morning, we're going to continue with the, um, the series that we've been dealing with. For those of you that are new to new creation, just to kind of bring you up to speed. Um, last year, the word of the Lord came to Bishop Cooper saying that this would be the year of the supernatural. And so the Lord laid it upon my heart to do a series of skits um, that would uh, support the word in the house. And so what we've been doing is um, showcasing some of the men and women that God have used to usher in the supernatural here in North America. We opened up with a man by the name of William J. Seymour, followed him up with a woman by the name of Catherine Kuhlman, and followed her up with a man by the name of um, Smith Wigglesworth. Thank you. And uh, so on today, we want to end the series with a woman by the name of Mariah Woodward Etter. Now, Mother Etter, as she came to be known as, was a, a pioneer in the gospel because she was a pioneer as it pertained to women in ministry. Mariah was born during a time where women were considered second-class citizens. And as a result of that, you didn't see women in ministry unless they were a support system to their husband. They, you know, they got married, they had kids, they raised their children, and they were a support system to their husbands. But God was calling Mariah to the forefront, but she was resisting the call because she knew that there was no women in ministry. So what'd she do? She got married, she had six kids, and her and her husband bought a farm. But five of her children died at a young age, and the farm that they, were, that they bought re, uh, refused to produce fruit. So, all, so because of that, Mariah decided to go forth in ministry, and God blessed and used her mightily. Now, Mariah went and did powerful things for the Lord, but the hallmark of her ministry was the wonder of the vision, of the trance. And it was known that she would be preaching and then she would freeze. And then she would freeze for not just a minute, but for eight hours at, at one time. And she wouldn't move, she wouldn't flinch, she wouldn't blink, she wouldn't do anything. When she would come out of the trance, she would pick up exactly where she left off, not knowing what was going on around her. When she would come out of the vision, she would communicate what God showed to her in, uh, when she would come out of the trance, she would communicate with people what God showed to her in visions. And that's what I want to concentrate on today, the trance and the vision. Because if ever we need vision, if ever we need supernatural vision, it is today. Supernatural vision, supernatural revelation, supernatural insight today. And so the Bible says that without vision, the people perish. Without, one translation says, without revelation, the people cast off restraint. So what I want to do on today, before they come forth, I want to share with you guys something God has been dealing with me about. We've been dealing with the reset here lately, and um, we've been talking about uh, church attendance. And the initial question posed to us was, why don't people come to church, right? And of course, there was a plethora of reasons thrown out there, many of which I can personally identify with. Um, but then the Lord started, I started to think, coupled with the, the questions and, and the reasons that people don't come to church, I started thinking about the, the st statistics that say that a bunch of people is leaving the church. So I started to wonder, God, is the church even relevant today? Have you ever wondered that? Is the church still relevant? So the Lord said to me, Don, yeah, I want to share something with you. I want to share with you why, one of the reasons why people are leaving or, or, or don't want to come to church, and I want to share with you why the church is still relevant. He says, the reason people don't want to come to church, and that's non-Christian and Christians, is because they have lost the reverential fear of going to hell. And because they've lost the reverential fear of going to hell, they've lost the reverential fear of me. It's kind of like a disobedient child. When you say to that child, don't do that. If you do it again, I'm going to spank your tushy. So when the child does it, you extend grace to that child, and you keep extending grace. After a while, that child is no longer going to fear the threat. That child also will no longer fear you. So the Lord says, what's happening here is that the non-believer believes I am just love. How could a loving God put good people in a bad place like hell? It don't make sense. But what they fail to realize is not only is he love, but he's also a just judge. And the wages of sin is death. Amen? But on the flip side of that coin, we have the believer. Believers don't fear hell because believers believe they're exempt from going to hell. And that's not true. What do you mean, Lord? I mean, when I gave my life to the Lord, I, when, I thought I was on my way to heaven. He says it's true. You are on your way to heaven. 
But just because you give your life to the Lord and you know him as your Savior, it does not mean that you're going to make it to heaven. God, explain that to me. Right? He said, let me put it to you this way. I was watching a television program called The Middle. And in this particular episode, the young lady won five prepaid tickets to, uh, to uh, Disneyland, right? The family had never had a family vacation, so they were excited, right? They, they loaded up the car, packed up their bags, and they're headed for their first family vacation. When they got to the amusement park, they got out of the car, got in that long line, and waited in that hot sun. When they got to the front of the line, the lady took their tickets and said, these tickets are for Disneyland. They said, and? She said, well, this is Disney World. <laughs> she said, Disneyland is in California. You are in Florida. So the husband and the wife got upset with each other because they were so excited about their first family vacation that nobody took the time to, prop, to, uh, 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 to, to sit down, study out, and map out the proper way to get to the proper destination called Disneyland. So they ended up in, Cal in Florida in Disney World. They went in the complete opposite direction. The Lord said, that's why some of my people will end up in hell. See, what happens is when we get saved, Jesus gives us prepaid tickets to heaven, purchased by the precious blood of the Lamb. And these tickets give us access to heaven. But what happens is we get so excited about going to heaven, so excited about having our sins forgiven, that we forget to take the proper time to map out the proper path to get to the destination called heaven. So we find ourselves, we find ourselves with prepaid tickets to heaven, walking down the wrong path, headed to hell. God says, and this is why the church is still relevant. What happens is, it's not enough to know Jesus as your savior. You also need to know him as your shepherd. You also need to know him as your shepherd. The Lord says, Danielle, see, there are so many things that can happen from the time you get saved to the time your life story ends that can cause you to get off track. That's why we need the church. He says, let me map out your life for you. I was like, no, God, not my life. So he said, let me show you your path up to this point. When I was a baby Christian, I loved the word. But I didn't understand it. So I went to my friend and she says, Danielle, I said, look, I don't understand this tea. She says, well, go to church. Because she knew that in church I would find the proper understanding. Then when my friends started pulling me back into the world, they said, Danielle, you're in the military. You're in Hawaii. You're young. It's Friday night. Let's go to the beach. Teresa said, we got church. Because she knew I needed a proper fellowship. And a proper fellowship would come in the church. Then God started to deal with me in dreams and I was freaking out because I didn't understand so I wasn't sleeping at night one night I came to church and the word of the Lord said young lady God is dealing with you in the night season he hears you when you pray he's establishing some things into you that night after edification came in the church then God began to deal with me about serving because you know how it is after a while we get bored so God says make yourself available to the church and I'm thinking, but I don't know what I could do. He says, make yourself available. And as I made myself available, enablement came in the church. Then he started dealing with me about the call of God on my life. And I'm like, well, God, I'm just 93 pounds at the time. I'm 93 pounds. I'm black. I'm a female. I'm single. What could I possibly say? I'm not, you know, I haven't gone to seminary school. I get anxiety when I stand before people. And I went to church one night. And the word of the Lord came saying, look, young lady. God has a call on your life. He wants to use you. So affirmation came in the church. Then I went through church hurt. But even in the, the confusion, even in the hopelessness, even in the brokenness, my mentor took me back to the church because she says, Danielle, the church is bigger than one local congregation. The church is universal. The church is global. So she brought me back to the church. When I came to the church that very night, someone said, young lady, the enemy's messing with you. He's trying to, he's broken your heart and he's, he's messing with your peace. He says, but God is going to restore it. And over time, restoration came in the church. Then I got to that place where I felt like, you know, God didn't do what I, asked, I expected him to do. So I lost faith in God. And even in that, God started dealing with me about going to church, but I shut him down. I don't want to hear it. I'm not going. 
So when I shut my spirit down, when I, when I muted God's voice, God began to deal with me through my husband. You will go to church. Now, I can be just as ghetto as anybody else, right? But my husband is cut from a different mold. His eyes kind of glazed over. I thought, well, maybe I should go to church. So when I came to church, the word of the Lord said, look, young lady, you, you kind of lost your footing. Get up, dust yourself all off, and start all over again. And that night, correction came in the church. And I saw a pattern there. At very pivotal moments in my life, that word pivotal means cru crucial to where you can cause a direction change. When I pivoted to the left, God redirected me to the church. When I pivoted to the right, he redirected me to the church. When I pivoted away from him, he redirected me to the church. Why? Because that's what a good shepherd does. He will redirect you on the right path in the church. That's why the church is still relevant. So he says this. From the foundation of the world, God knew you and I would need a, a, a physical manifestation of himself in the earth realm. So he birthed into the earth the church. Because he knew one day we would need natural arms wrapped around us. We would need a physical hand touching ours. We would need a pat on the back. So he birthed into the earth the church so that the church could be the comfort of God in the earth realm. He knew one day you and I would need a natural, he, a, a physical voice of encouragement, a physical word of exhortation, a physical word of affirmation. So he birthed into the earth the church so the church could be the voice of God in the earth realm. He knew from time to time that you and I, because he has given us free will, would turn our backs on him. He knew that from time to time you and I would go our own way instead of his. We will want our own will instead of his. So he birthed into the earth, the church, so that the church could be a rod of, of correction, not, not, not of abuse, a rod of discipline, not of control. He birthed into the earth, the church, so that the church could be the shepherd of God in the earth realm, coupled with the Holy Ghost. If you want to be led, it's not enough just to know Jesus as your Savior. To make it to heaven, to get these prepaid tickets, and to get to that place, you need to know him as your shepherd. Amen? Amen.